Hi, I'm Kevin and welcome to my channel. Today we're going to go out to the forest with a mentor of mine, Malcolm Squires. Mac, as he's known, is a retired forester who over 40 years ago was in charge of the renewal of the forest that we're going to go visit. Mac is a real treasure trove of forestry knowledge because some of these sites he's been visiting almost every year for the past 40, 50, some of these sites 60 years in a row. And um, so he's accumulated an awful lot of observational knowledge. He's also a guy who keeps up with the current scientific literature on the subjects. And um, he also still, even into his 80s, he contributes professional articles to uh, professional forestry journals. So uh, he's a guy to listen to about uh, things going on in the forest. The theme for today is cooperation and competition. Do trees cooperate with each other or do they compete with each other for resources? We're going to visit three different sites today. Each one of these sites now uh, supports a spruce forest. The first one is going to be uh, a site that was harvested back in 1985 and Malcolm had a, a hand in uh, organizing the planting of that site in 1987. And the next two sites are going to be stands that originated from a forest fire. Uh, the first stand is 93 years of age now and the next one is well over 100 years of age. So let's get out to the forest and put the camera in front of Malcolm. We're here standing in a black spruce plantation. It's getting that it's reaching up for the sun. It has been doing that ever since 1987 when the trees were planted. The area had previously had a stand of Primarily black spruce with some jack pine. The harvested trees were pulled to roadside by wheeled skidders. Hills greenhouses out at Murillo had uh, grown some black spruce seedlings for us in paper pot containers. And we delivered them to here in reefer vans and stored them until we were ready to plant. The trees were planted by a firm known as uh, Brinkman's at the time. And uh, I think they did a marvelous job for us. We have here now a stand that could actually be harvested for pulpwood and you might even find an occasional saw log in it. As we look around, we see that the sun is filtering in in small bits. Uh, we even see a balsam fir that's shade tolerant that's crept in here and there will be more as time goes by. On the ground, we've got almost a complete cover of feather moss. That's a typical natural black spruce condition. It happens as the stands close canopy and you get the shade. And we've obviously got near close canopy here. The trees are intertwined, the twig branches at their tips have intertwined, which is pretty normal condition as the stand matures. As it grows taller and taller, as you can see the lower branches die off in the shade. Now, a little aside here, black spruce is known as relatively shade tolerant. So uh, why do those lower branches die off? Well, they're not needed as the tree grows taller. Uh, most of the growing area comes from the energy created by sun and uh, nutrients in the green foliage. So as the branches are closed together, the sun can't get down, there's no need for those branches. So they just shed their foliage and gradually the branches themselves fall off. But I'm always fascinated how the branches interlock. Now, as this stand gets older, the wind gets play into the trees and they're taller. And the taller they get, the more they sway and they abrade each other. So what we end up with then is the needles start getting scraped off and some of the branch tips get snapped off. Then we get an accumulation on the ground of green foliage tip branches. And if there had been a snow cover here at this time of year, you would see a pretty dense collection of black spruce needles and broken branch tips. This stand is a little different from most. We entered this stand about 10 years after it was harvested and did what we call some spatial thinning. 
we thinned out some of the yet tiny trees to give the better trees more growing space. So what you see here now is the trees that were left, considered to have been the best trees. But if you look around, you can see that there's still an occasional log left over here. That was probably a decaying tree at the time and was not thought to be worthwhile. One thing I did look for here, but didn't find any evidence of, was evidence of mycorrhizae on the roots. Obviously those trees have access to mycorrhizae because they would have a difficult time of growing as well as they've obviously grown without the activity of mycorrhizae on their roots. Mycorrhizae are known to exchange nutrients with the trees, one tree to another, and even from other plants than the spruce trees themselves. So, uh, and uh, also assist with water movement. Okay. As a young forester, I often pondered about the question, do trees compete or do they help each other? Something like humans do, we do both. Well, we're going to stand here and offer some evidence. And I've concluded over the years, helped by the research of many others, that the answer to the question, do trees compete, is yes and no. Uh, in this particular stand, if we look around, it's a natural black spruce jack pine fire stand, precisely 93 years old from date of fire. The trees could be considered mature. Some might call it old growth at this stage, because a lot of the trees are falling over, wind uh, damage, uh, root rot, which tends to winter any stand about 50 years old. So we've got a lot of ground there. So trees are obviously dying for some reason. What's killing them? I mentioned the root rot. There are various fungi that get into the trees, but wind is a primary problem. We also can look up and see what the trees are doing, how they relate to each other space-wise. But let's consider the whole aspect of a tree. The tree has roots, it has a crown, it has a stem. So there are very many areas where we, trees can be competing and many areas where they can be cooperating. My personal assessment is that most of the cooperation occurs underground and a lot of research tends to bear me out on it. But as we get above ground, particularly as we look up, we begin to question how much trees are cooperating. Yes, we read that some research has shown that uh, they emit uh, some sprays into the air and warn each other of insects, etc. And uh, I have no doubt that's so. But you look up and you see the tree crowns in this stand, they're thin. And you look at the ground and you see debris on the ground. And I've followed stands like this for, yes, believe it or not, 70 years. And practically every stand you walk in in the spring, particularly in the snow, you'll see a, a lot of debris, the branch tips, particularly needles. You won't be able to segregate the needles here in this background, but you can certainly see the twigs. <clears throat> Those twigs generally come from abrasion and wind. As trees get older and gain height, they begin to whip back and forth more in strong winds. And particularly in winter when the twigs are frozen, they're brittle, these twigs snap off. And what you'll see when you look up is not trees that are avoiding each other, it's trees that at one time, as we've seen in other shots, that the branches tend to interlock as the trees are younger. But as they age, you'll see that they're backing off from each other. Not because of choice, but because of wind action, whipping back and forth and breaking out the branch tips. So what we have here then is an old stand that the sunlight is starting to get in more and more. And we have what I've said is a stand that is 
helped itself, it helped each other, but also competed. The competition above ground is mainly for space. The reason I wanted to come into this particular stand, Kevin, was its similarity to the plantation that we were videoing. Uh, you see a black spruce stand, trees scattered around, some of them clumped like this, and some of them lots of wide space between them. But otherwise, the stand is very similar. Black spruce stems with no living branches till you get well up. But the big difference here is that this is a over a hundred years old. The plantation that we were standing in is in its mid-30s. So, what is the big difference here? The big difference is the tree height. You've got to go way up, you've got to go 30, 40 feet, 10 meters, 12 meters up to find a living branch, green branch. And up, as you look up further, you see the results of the crown competition where the trees have been rubbing back and forth and they've knocked off branch tips and lots of needles so the crowns are very thin. I'm talking about this, I think back to my earlier years as a, a forester when most of my job related to research of stand growth. How fast is a stand of trees? like this grow and I had almost 1,000 permanent sample plots to work with. They had been established in 1946-47. I've worked as a student remeasuring them in 1956-57. I managed the remeasurement of it and worked on it again in 1967 and in 1977 I wrote the final report on three decades of stand development. Well, so to make a long story short, I discovered that pretty well all the stands that I was finding, I was measuring in those plots, it started out as a newly regenerated stand of some 15 to 20,000 stems per hectare. By the time the stand got to the age of this one, or even halfway to the age, say 50 years old, the stand density had dropped back to about 1,200 to 1,500 trees per hectare. What was happening, that despite the fact that the trees were probably cooperating underground with root grafting and mycorrhizae, exchanging nutrients, etc., above ground, something different was going on. As the trees gained height, they were closing off the sunlight to the ground and the lower parts of the trees, and they were shedding branches. Not just shedding branches, but all of their greenery. So that the trees that were not up into the canopy, they were dying because of lack of light. But how, how come? How, how come you get this gradual reduction in stems per hectare? It's because of the competition of the crowns. They're no longer cooperating up there. It's competition people. They get taller and taller, and as they get taller, they sway more in the wind, and they start abrading. And if you look around the ground at any black spruce forest in particular, but if jack pine or balsam fir or white spruce, this time of year in May, after the snow's all gone, or even on the snow in the last month or so, you're going to see an accumulation of tree litter. Tops of bushes of black spruce, such as you have here. You can find them some getting bigger, but there's okay. lots of it out to the area. Oh, here's one that's different. This one was not knocked off by wind. It's got a very clean cut end on it. It's been chipped off by a red squirrel. Why did the red squirrel chip it off? Oh, look at all those cones. That's red squirrel food, people and they tend to shape black spruce. You've often seen black spruce with a very tiny tip on it and uh, a long tip with no branches. That's because red squirrels have chipped off those cone-bearing twigs. So what else can we say here about this? Well, it's uh, starting to fall down. It's 
reached its best before age, just like me, and uh, its end is in sight. <laughs> All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you did, I'm going to throw some other links to videos I've done with Malcolm Up right now. You can uh, go check those out if you like. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please hit like, share, and subscribe. As always, I hope you have a great day, and I hope you find some time to get outdoors. Thank you.